I have a pleasure to welcome the Reverend Michael Hutchinson. Please, uh, please come up and join us. Great to have you with us today, all the way from uh, Preston, you, yes. I believe. Yes. Excellent. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself, Michael? Yeah, um, so I'm Michael. I'm a curate at a church called St Cuthbert's in Philwood, just at the north of Preston. I've been doing that for seven months, so I've been ordained for seven months. Before that, I was a student in Lancaster. It's good to see some Lancaster crew um, coming down to, to join us tonight. So, yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. Brilliant. Are you able to tell us um, a time when God has been working where you've seen? Yeah, sure. Work? So yep. I was thinking about this, and I didn't have a really good answer um, before just now, but God is present and active and working in the church. There's a dirty lie in society that says that people aren't interested in God anymore, and that people don't want to come to church anymore, and that the church is going down and failing, and it is going. And that is a lie, because look around. Look around. You see this? This is where God is working. The very fact that we can stand here tonight and say, God, you will never let me down. That is where God is at work. Amen. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. I'd um, just like to pray for Michael before he preaches to us. Lord, bring Michael before you now. Thank you for the preparation he's made for this talk. I pray that what he says will be of your word. Help us, Lord, to have open ears to hear the message he brings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so I've got a reading for us tonight. So if you've got a phone, uh, or a Bible on your phone, I was going to say a phone on your Bible. If you've got a Bible on your phone, flick to John chapter 14, if you would. I don't know if there's any physical Bibles around either. Feel free to, to follow in a physical Bible or on your phone Bible. John chapter 14, and it's verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> Jesus comforts his disciples. Ah, it's up there. I didn't realize. Good to know. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may, may be where I am. You know the place to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him, and have seen him. And I'll just continue on to verse 11. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's just pray. God, you are very big and we are very small. So would you send your Holy Spirit down among us this evening to be our teacher so that we might see more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, not long ago, um, we were on a, a trip to a friend's house in Italy. It was before coronavirus, so don't worry. Um, there was about 10 of us and we were relaxed and happy as we go off to this lovely place in, uh, in the summer. It was in Rome, and um, there was quite a few of us. So I, I said to my friends, are you sure there'll be room for us all? And she says, I, I told you, didn't I? You'll see that there's plenty of room for all of us. We had been imagining the ten of us that she lived in just an ordinary house on an ordinary street, even maybe with an extension built on the back, then maybe an ordinary house could hold, I don't know, a 
couple of us comfortably, but not that many of us. So how on earth could she manage to squeeze us in? How was this going to work? Were we going to sleep on our living room floor? What would her parents say? What was going to happen? And we turned up onto her driveway, and then we realised this wasn't an ordinary street, and it wasn't an ordinary house. She lived in a mansion, my friend did. And she sort of grinned at us a bit shyly. Um, and she said, I told you there'd be room, didn't I? And we tumbled out and she took us upstairs and there was like long corridors and lots of rooms and we couldn't believe it. It was kind of like a hotel and it was her father's house. And I really think that that's the image that Jesus is using in our reading today. He's going away and his disciples are naturally really worried about where he's going and whether they'll be able to follow him. Because if you think about it, they've left everything to follow this guy. They've left their homes, they've left their occupations to follow Jesus. And they're now faced with what seems to be complete failure. The noble cause that they thought they'd given themselves to for three years, it just seems to be about to crumble. And so Jesus speaks of his father's house. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, so believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And I think this promise is like a way of assuring the disciples that although he's uh, going away, that it'll be for their benefit and that he won't forget them and that he's not going to abandon them. But I think it actually reaches out beyond just to the disciples on that dark evening and it embraces each one of us here tonight. Jesus says that he won't forget us no matter how dark or strange the situations that we find ourselves in. He says he won't abandon us. Perhaps you've heard these words used at funerals before, and I think we can probably understand why these words are appropriate. Because it's true to say in life that we can't always see the way ahead. You can't even see a day ahead, never mind six months ahead sometimes. And we need to know not only that there is a way into this unknown future, but we also want to know that we'll be able to find it and that we'll be able to get there. And you know, I think within all of us, maybe you're like me, I don't know, but within me anyway, and maybe, maybe within all of us, there's like a natural tendency not to trust God very much, and not to, really, not to really believe that he is good and that he wants the best for us, but to be kind of afraid and kind of a little bit working in our own power, because trust in God it's actually just really hard. And I think that we, we all of us struggle to really truly believe that God is good and that he wants the best for us. And I think that's why it's so hard to trust God with our future and why we try so, so very hard to take care of ourselves. And I think it's also why the idea of dying terrifies us, whether we're Christian or not. I think each of us actually, we have like a natural tendency to shut God out. Can God really be trusted at the end of the day? And I think actually we especially do this if we're in pain or if we're, we're suffering. We cry out and we sometimes even shut God out from our pain. And sometimes, I don't know if you have ever done this, we might even try to punish God by saying, I'm not talking to you anymore. You let that happen. I'm not talking to you anymore, God. And we flee from him and we shut the doors of our hearts and we shut ourselves in to the darkest corners of our pain. And I don't mean that judgmentally on you. I'm not meaning to, um, to say that we're all terrible people. I just mean to say that it's really easy to do that. It's really natural to do that, to shut God out. I think particularly when we're in pain. <clears throat> or maybe also... Sometimes we're just not sure where to turn to find God. God can seem like he's just so far away or just so strange an idea that where, could, where can I possibly find God? Is this prayer thing really real? Can I really just talk to God? 
Or we might even wonder, is it, is it possible to find God at all? Have we made it all up in our own heads? I don't know if you have those thoughts, like me. Perhaps we can hear our own voice in the voice of Thomas in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And I know I can hear my voice in his. What are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. And Jesus' reply to that has haunted and confronted the world's imagination then and ever since then. He says, I am the way. If you want to know how to get to the Father's house, you must come with me, says Jesus. He's not like somebody who sort of just knows the way to the house, like a good teacher or something like that. He's not just some, somebody that's able to point you over there and say the way is over there, but he's the one who is himself the way. Here's the only bit of ancient Greek that I learned in college that's useful. In these verses in Greek, which is the language that these verses were originally written in, it says this, it says, Igo imi he hodos. Now, I me means I am. And ego means I. So literally translated, this verse says, I, I am. It's not necessary. You don't need to say I, I am. That's, that's like a silly, wasteful use of language. Nobody would do that, really, unless there was some kind of point to it. And what, I think what we get from the Greek in this, it's a kind of like a, a big underline and a bold of the I. He's sort of saying, me, I am the way. This one over here, nobody else, me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I go, I me, he hold us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, within the Western world over the last two centuries or so, this saying of Jesus has become one of the most offensive and most controversial of all of his sayings. How dare he say that? How dare he, John, or the church, or anyone else, put such words into someone's mouth? Isn't this the height of arrogance to imagine that Jesus, or anybody else, is the only way to truth and life? The minute I'm, um, I'm running an alpha course at the church that I'm at at the minute, in Cuthbert's and Fullwood, and the other week, um, two of her guests they felt quite offended at the end of the session. And the session was, how can I have faith? And they said so to the guy from the church who, uh, who was the table host that they were sitting on. They said they were a bit offended at the end of the session. And he was naturally quite worried that the guest was offended because like, we're polite people. And he was sort of saying to me, you know, how can we go about taking back the offense that we seem to have caused? But you know, as I thought about it, I realized that I think the offended guest was really just being quite perceptive of that the fact that this is actually quite an offensive message to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way, the only truth, and the only life. It's a massive claim to make, and it's astonishingly arrogant if it's not true. How dare he claim that? How dare he claim to be the only way? And don't we know now, as well, to play devil's advocate, that this, this, this kind of attitude, it's, it's actually done untold damage around the world, as Jesus' followers have insisted that everybody else should give up their own ways of life and follow his instead? Because that's a consequence, and let's not pretend that it's not. If Jesus is truly the only way, then that has implications if we're trying to follow other ways than his. But the problem is that um, something has to form your way. Something has to be the way that we live our lives. If you dethrone Jesus from that, then you enthrone something else naturally in its place. Even if it is just this principle that all views are kind of relative 
and what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you, and that that's fine if they're not the same thing. That's the common cultural mindset today. It's, it's a bit like, don't tell me I'm wrong, because you know my emotions and my experiences, they're my own, and they're just as valid as anybody else's, and my religion is just as valid as anybody else's. That's a, a mindset called postmodernism, if you're interested in that and you want to look that up later on, postmodernism. That's the, the common cultural mindset of today. And I do, I do think that this belief that you know, all religions are basically the same, it sounds quite nice and it sounds very democratic, but the study of religions very quickly shows that it's just not true when you scratch the surface of that belief. And I think what we're saying, if we try to claim that they're all the same, is that none of them are really more than just distant echoes or distorted images of reality. We're saying that um, you know, reality or God or the divine, it's somehow remote and unknowable and over there and a bit strange, and that neither Jesus nor Buddha nor Moses nor Krishna gives direct access to it. That somehow each of those provide like a way to the foothills but they don't provide the way to the summit. But the problem is that, that that's just not what John's gospel says. And you lose John's gospel if that idea is embraced. I think the whole of the New Testament actually, and indeed the whole of early Christianity, insists that the one true and living God, the creator, is the God of Israel. And that the God of Israel has acted decisively within the history of the world within Israel and within Israel's story to bring the world to its goal and through that to rescue us and to rescue the world. I think this idea of like a vague general truth to which all religions bear witness, it, I think that's really foreign to Christianity actually. And it, it is, in fact, it's not a modern idea. I think we think that that's quite a modern idea, but it's not. Um, that was first sort of thought of in the 18th century as a protest against Christianity, even though like, it's some, sometimes produced like a rabbit out of the hat in the pub um, as like a, a special weapon against Christianity nowadays, but it's, it's quite an old idea, that. But the real, the real answer is that, and though of course it's true that like, lots of Christians and lots of churches have been really arrogant in how they present the gospel, the whole setting of this passage shows that such arrogance is a denial of the very truth that it's claiming to present. For the truth and the life through which we know and find the way is Jesus himself. The Jesus who washed his disciples' feet and told them to copy their example. And the Jesus who was on his way to give his life as the shepherd of the sheep. Was that arrogance? And was that self-serving? I, I don't think it is. So I am the way, the only way. And secondly, I am the truth. Again, Jesus isn't just claiming to know the truth. He's not claiming to know about the truth. He's not claiming to be just really wise or a really good dude or a really good teacher or a really good moral example. He's saying here that he is the truth. And that's really strange. That's a really strange one because that's not how we normally talk about truth today. Um, today, for, for me, like truth is more like an inbuilt mathematical thing. It relies on like logic and intellect for me, truth. It relies on like evidence and what's actually happening in a particular situation. Like it's normal in our language to say that I'm talking at the minute and like maybe 75% of us are listening at best. Only joking. But that's like a truth claim, I'm, I'm talking. That's how we normally use the word truth. But what Jesus is saying is the truth isn't a set of propositions to be grasped by the intellect, but that truth is a person and truth has a name and it's a person to be received and therefore knowable only through relationship. Truth is a person. His name is Jesus. And if you know him, 
then you know everything that is true in the world. And let me say, that's very offensive too. That's a very offensive thing that I've just said. Because if Jesus really is the truth and the only truth, then that means that all of my clever thoughts in my head and all of my clever morals, they're not. If Jesus is Lord, then I'm not. And that means that he can tell me what to do and that he's right. And that if I disobey him, then I'm wrong. And believe me, that sits very badly in our culture today. That is a very offensive message. And it's a very bitter pill to swallow, actually, whenever I'm trying to persuade myself that what I do is right, and I do that all the time. That's a really hard message to accept for me. And take this, for example. Um, I've recently been going into a prison to help out on something called a restorative justice program. And there's this lad in here, right? And he's getting out next month. He's getting out the day after the course finishes, lucky for him. And he's really wrestling with what he does about this group of lads uh, just down the street. They hang out just down the bottom of the street. He calls them those maggots. He doesn't like them very much because they've done him wrong and he wants to revenge himself on them. He worries that whenever he gets out, if he turns the other cheek, that that will invite more trouble upon himself. And that's the truth for him. And to be honest, I can kind of see his logic. It makes sense to me what he says. But Jesus overrules that, I think. I've not told him that because he's dead hard. He's a bit scary. <laughs> no, no, not really. Um, I've, I've not told him that because I'm, I'm not really allowed to talk about things like that in there or else they could cancel the whole course. Um, but Jesus overrules. And since Jesus is Lord, even whenever I can't quite piece it together that he's the one in charge, he's right. And he defines what right is on his own. He doesn't, he's not beneath some moral standard that he sort of perfectly fills. He is right itself. He defines what right is. If you want to know what truth is, we look at Jesus. And I think here's a consequence of that um, for me and you today. Not only do we have to bend our knee to Jesus who is truth, but when we evangelize or when we tell other people about Jesus, it means that we don't need to know all the answers because we're not trying to construct like this set of propositions, this set of ideas about Jesus that's very persuasive to people. That's not what truth is. Truth is a person. We don't need all the answers. We need to say, hey, I, I know this guy. He lived 2,000 years ago. He died, he rose again, and that's dead strange. But it's the truth, I believe. And we invite people to come to meet him. That's a very different way of seeing evangelism and how we tell other people about Jesus. We don't need to build like a clever Jesus without any holes in the argument. That's not how it works. But rather, it's, it's like holding your, your hand out to your friend and your enemy and saying, come with me and meet this guy. You can meet him in the church, I hope, sometimes. Depends which church. No, I'm only joking. It doesn't depend what church. You can meet him in the church. You can meet him outside the church too. You can meet him in lots of different ways. But come and meet him. Because he is the way, the truth. And thirdly, he claims that he's the life. And he claims that he's the only life. Knowing Jesus is what knowing true life is. Life that not even death can interrupt. Eternal life is to know Jesus. It's to know this man who walked the earth and died on a cross and rose again to new life on Easter Day. That's what life is. And apart from that, apart from him, is darkness and death, sadly. If Jesus is the only life, then that means there's no life outside of him. And that's, a, again, a very extraordinary and offensive claim. I think the Bible teaches us that God came to us because he wanted to join us on the road. He wanted to join us on the journey, to listen to our story, and to help us realize that we're not just walking around in circles, but that we're moving towards the Father's house of peace and joy. That's the great mystery of Christmas, 
the great strange thing that happens at Christmas, we're not alone on the journey. The God of love who gave us our life, he sent his only son to be with us and to be with us at all times and in all places so that we never have to feel lost in the struggles of life, but that we can always trust that he's there beside us. And the challenge for us then is to let God be like that and to let God be who he wants to be, to let him into our lives. Again, you might not be like this, but for me, I think there's a big part of me that clings to my aloneness and wants to live alone, far from God. And I don't want to let God in to touch me, especially where I feel in pain. I don't want him in. And I want to shut those doors where I feel maybe guilty or ashamed or confused or lost. And thus, we don't give him a chance to be with us where we feel most alone. And we hide ourselves in that dark room. I don't know if you're like that. But praise God that he doesn't leave us there in a place of darkness. He doesn't leave us there. But he comes in the man, Jesus Christ, to search us out and to pour his risen life all over our life, our stories and our lives. Each one of us here tonight, our lives are wrapped up in a bigger life, the life of Jesus as he hunts for our hearts. And I really wish someone had told me this before, because I've, I've only recently realized it, that it's not actually we who search out God. It's not us that find God in amazingly improbable circumstances. It's not what it is. It's God who searches for us. God is looking for each one of us at all times. And in all places, God searches for us. He's not far away. He's not distant. He's not nearly impossible to find. As Thomas might have suggested in verse 5. How can we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. He's not hard to find. He's near. As Jesus says in verse 7 of our reading. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. And from now on, you do know him. And you have seen him. And his disciples couldn't grasp that. Perhaps it was their Jewish backgrounds where it's just completely unthinkable that man could be God. It's pretty unthinkable, really. It is pretty crazy. And we see that Philip in verse 8, he couldn't grasp it either, that to know the Son is to know the Father. And to see the Son is to see the Father. We see God in Jesus. That's what he says in verse 9. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. But you know, I think that this claim of Jesus to be the way and the truth and the life, it leaves us basically with a couple of choices. We can either accept that it's true and follow him, accept a radically changed life as a result of this crazy claim, or we can dismiss it as the ravings of a madman and just go about our lives as normal. I'm not sure how many other options there are. I think it's either true or he's totally mad and he believed it was true but it's wrong. Or he's just a downright liar and it's just false. I think those are logically our options with this. So was he what he claims? Was he this claim? Or was he intentionally lying? Or was he just crazy? That's the ultimate question that faces us tonight. I wonder what we say to it. I wonder what you say to that question tonight. What do you say to him who comes to try to find you? Saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. So as I wrap, as I wrap up, as I finish this evening... It may be for some of us that we're not quite ready um, to place our trust in Jesus and in that God. It may be that we, uh, we'd like to believe it, but we're just not ready to let him in in that way. It may be that we've shut God out because maybe something's happened to us in the past or we've got some painful experience that we don't, let, we don't want to let God near. There's some corner of our heart that we'd rather hold apart from God. 
perhaps our whole heart. I don't know. And if that's you, then it might be that during the next songs that you, you'd like to just find some space um, just, to, just to sit. That's fine. Um, without singing or doing anything, that's fine. Or if you'd like somebody to pray with you, um, then please do um, find someone you trust and ask them to pray with you. It might be somebody in the back corner of the prayer ministry team. I'm happy to pray with you if you'd like me to. Um, but do, do come for prayer if that's you. Or it may be um, that for some of us here tonight that we really identify with Thomas's voice. Um, we don't know where you're going. How on earth can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. And as life casts us about on all of these different tides, and there seems to be so many different ways and different options that we could take, well, to you I say, trust in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. And he's a light in the darkness. He will not let you down. And for others here tonight, I wonder if Jesus, the truth, has some words to speak gently and in great love into our hearts tonight. He who is God, he who is Lord. Is he calling us away from darkness and into light tonight? Is he calling us to tell a friend or a loved one about him tonight? Please don't let this evening go by without speaking to somebody you trust about that. And if you feel that God has put like a word or a verse or a picture on your heart for this whole church, then please do come and just come and say that to one of the leaders and uh, they can try and decide whether that's appropriate or not. And we can think about that together. So let me finish now um, with a clip from The Lord of the Rings. Great film. And in it, um, Pippin is facing the end and he's sitting with Gandalf. And I think it just displays so many truths about our situation in life and death and in the life that the Lord Jesus holds for each one of us in his Father's house. If we could have the clip, please, that would be brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Sunrise. Well, the lessons are bad. <laughs> 